past two years, I've been living in a town called Pontypridd. This is a rural town in South Wales, right in the mouth of the Rhondda Valley. In 2019, Pontypridd became the first Welsh town to earn the official government B friendly status. Not only is it the first town in Wales, it is also one of very few across the United Kingdom. This made me wonder, why isn't every town bee friendly? What are we doing that is so drastically unfriendly? To understand this, I need to dig a little bit deeper into what it was Ponty Preeth was doing specifically to gain this status. To find this out, I took to the internet. This is where I found the Facebook group, Be Friendly Ponty Preeth. This is a group of local people contributing ideas and celebrating the work that has been done to gain this status. Their group photo being a mural created by one of Pontypridd's local artists in honour of this bee friendly status. From here I was able to find the Friends of the Earth organisation and more specifically the Friends of the Earth Pontypridd group. I was able to get in contact with one of the members of the Friends of the Earth Pontypridd group. His name is Casper Harris. He works very closely with all of the Pontypridd environmental groups, including the Bee Friendly one. Here is an interview that I had with Casper. Hello, Casper. How are you? Um, not too bad. Yes. How are you? I'm I'm doing well considering the circumstances. I hope you're staying safe. Yeah, yeah. I'm staying staying home. My wife's working from home, so we're um, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. I was wondering if you could quickly introduce yourself and where uh, where you work and uh, the work that you do. Um, my name is Casper Harris and I'm the coordinator for Pontypridd Friends of the Earth. Um, it's a voluntary position um, and um, well, that's kind of a hard work sometimes but quite rewarding. Wonderful. So what work is it primarily that you do with Friends of the Earth? So uh, as coordinator of the group, um, I'm just part of, because um, Friends of the Earth have different um, sort of local groups all around Wales, and I'm the coordinator for the Pontypridd one. So I basically um, have to kind of field, be the main focal point for the, and organiser for the group, basically. So I have to sort of organise meetings and receive um, any inquiries and kind of coordinate everything that's going on. We have other members who do, who can basically take a certain project and run with it and not often to sort of let them get on with it and support them in whatever way I can. But I'm the main sort of point of contact for the group. Brilliant. What you you mentioned projects. What sort of projects have you been doing with the Friends of the Earth? Um got, got quite a few different projects. Um uh, Friends of the Earth, um obviously they work on um environmental kind of campaigns, um sort of national international and on local level as well um so we um you know mainly on climate change and um, biodiversity you know two of the biggest things we work on um and you know some of our things are, are related to these sort of enormous issues like climate change but sometimes um we're looking at issues in our neighborhood or particular you know that, that are just happening sort of where we are and um because you can sometimes you can kind of really make a difference, and even on a bigger scale, it feels quite small. It's quite empowering to get things done in your sort of local area. Yeah. So you're working with environmental issues on a local scale, hoping to empower a greater scale. Yeah. Brilliant. So encouraging other communities to do this similar and follow in your footsteps. Yep. I mean, we have some some specific projects we've been working on um, as Pontypridd Friends of the Earth. Do you want me to go through them? That would be lovely if you don't mind. Yep. Um, so we've been um, had a bee friendly um, campaign over the last kind of three years, um, and that ended up resulting in Pontypridd being declared an official bee friendly town, which Woo! is uh, <laughs> which is something that um, uh, a Welsh government scheme where you can apply. You know, if you're doing these things, and uh, the main four points for that is about reducing pesticide, getting community involved. Um, the uh, increasing habitats and um, I've forgotten what the last one is now. <laughs> what was the last one? Um, 
Oh, and increasing food pollinators. So basically, of course. Like, well, you know, mainly flowers, really, and wildflowers. Mm. Um, so that's something that um, we have tremendous support from the town council with, and um, a lot of the um, community, you know, there's a great community here, and there are loads of community stuff around that, with schools, with um, the museum did a lot of stuff around around this, um, and there's quite a few little pop-up um, um, community gardens that are involved in this as well. And you know, even visitors in the town centre are helping as well. Um, so that's one of the projects we have. Um, we've been working for a few years on fossil fuel. So we've worked on fossil fuel divestment because um, Rhonda Cannon Taft Council, which is the, the county we live in, um, has at least well a few years ago had at least fifty million pounds invested in fossil fuel companies, and that's an ongoing campaign really. That's not quite been finished yet. Um, but he did campaign for Welsh government to divest from fossil fuels because their pension scheme has investments like that and they were successful. And um, for our MPs, um, uh, Westminster MPs, they have um, investments in fossil fuels as well. Um, so we, we campaigned on that. Another thing we've been doing is working, um, organising climate strikes. So last yeah. year um, to support the, the youth strikes for climate. And of course we, um, you know, we've, we've um, it's quite surprised as how big it was because a lot of the the, ch the children and the youth campaigners have been going down to Cardiff to campaign. And we said, well, for the for the general climate strike, let's do something here in Ponty. And we ended up with 150 people turning out, um, which is amazing, amazing. Much, much more than we expected. It's huge. Um, so that was a great turnout for that. And we've had some other ones since. Um, obviously, this year it's not been happening because. Um, of all the um, coronavirus stuff going on. You also had your issues with flooding in Pontypree. I imagine yeah. that's taken a toll on productivity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been one crisis to the next, really. I mean, that's like historic flooding we've had, you know, which affected my business personally that I run. That was very- Of course. Was very, you know, like businesses throughout town, um, a lot of personal property, a lot of people's houses have been flooded. You know, it's absolutely devastating. And of course now, at the time you interview me, it started raining for the first time in I don't know how long. You know, we've had the hottest, driest spring in record, I think, for the area. So we're definitely in the age of kind of extreme weather with all this. Of course. Nobody knows if they're coming or going and what's going to hit them next. No, no. So, you know, yeah. it shows the urgency of what we're doing. Yeah. Um, a couple of other things I was going to mention we've been working on. One is circular economy kind of things. We've set up a monthly repair cafe, so it's an informal place where people can bring in stuff they've got that's broken that they don't want to have to throw out and buy something new, and they've got experts, mm -hmm. electricians and that that can fix them. So you kind of keep stuff out of a landfill and reusing it then. And also we'd like to set up a borrowing library or a library of things, which is like a book library, but for objects that you can borrow. So instead of having to go mm -hmm. out and buy a drill or a step ladder you're going to use once, you can just borrow it and bring it back. So it's got a kind of communal mm -hmm. use and means people don't have to buy as much stuff. That's not been rolled out yet. That's something we want to do. Amazing. A uh, couple of other things. We um, litter picks. We do pretty regular litter picks um, around town and, um, you know, try and make people aware of, of plastics and, and the effects of plastic pollution. And, you know, we've got quite a few links with community gardens around town. And there's quite a few little kind of community grown projects. So I work with them as well about sort of local sustainable um, growing of food and, and, and plants and flowers. And actually, at the moment, we've just launched something new within the past few months that a couple of other people have led the organising with. It's called Grow Pontypreve. And what we're trying to do, because so many people are stuck indoors at the moment, is send out packs to people who've never really grown before or never really growing their own plants or their own food or their own flowers. Amazing. So growing their own backyard. And um, we're sending out a bunch of leaflets. Today's the second day we've done it with Pontypridd Food Bank because these are some of the most, you know, like um, struggling people. People are struggling with food food um, insecurity. So get them started and, you know, learning a little bit about growing your own food. Um, and that's, we've had a massive uptake of interest in that. Um, and we've got a Facebook page. Amazing. Yeah. I imagine that's very 
enjoyable and useful for those people. Hopefully, we'll see how it pans out. You know, it's just hit and miss with growing your own veg and your own flowers and stuff. But um, yeah, loads of people are interested, so that's great. Mm -hmm. So if we circle back to your bee friendly activities that you mentioned in the projects you've been doing, can you tell me more specifically, you mentioned schools and community engagement with being bee friendly. Are there some specific things within that, that you've been doing you can tell us about? Yeah, um, a lot of schools have been um, basically like sending the kids home with flowers, like sunflowers and stuff like that, planting it themselves and taking it home. Mm. They've been um, making little um, kind of like wild flower areas or little sort of gardens for the, you know, getting the, the children involved with that. Um, and what else they've been doing? They've been, and we've set up a, a bunch of planters around town um, mm. with, with bee friendly flowers in as well, because it's quite sort of con like the town centre in Pontypri, even though around the town on the hills, a lot of wildlife and biodiversity in Ponty Town, you know, it's quite concrete really particularly town center so you know that's we've had a good pickup with that um and the town center sorry the town council have been really supportive and they're basically doing a big review of their land and seeing how they can do it um how can they they can do things to maximize sort of natural wildflowers that are growing or, or sort of bee friendly planting um mm -hmm. and they have a field that they look after that they let the little the wildflowers bloom and they sort of delay the cutting of it in order to let those wildflowers bloom. Um, mm -hmm. Trying to think what else. And the park's changed its policy so that there's sections of the park where they they, they stagger cutting on it to, to let the wildflowers bloom. And there's a community garden um, group in the park that have been setting up a little community garden as well. Brilliant. Um, one thing I'd like to quickly mention is I'm part of the Be Friendly Ponty Preeth group online and I believe you or somebody else posted a petition to, in relation to uh, council mowing. Mm -hmm. yep. I wonder if you could tell me any more about that and how it's useful. Um, I set the, the petition up about um, a week ago. Um, it's, it's got over 200 signatures um, in that time. And what we're looking for... Um, so what ideally we would like is there's a huge area that, that Rhonda Cannon Tuff Council maintains and a lot of the verges beside roads um, and highways and in parks and graveyards, they, they cut back about every three or four weeks. So this, this doesn't give a chance for the, the wildflowers to bloom. And there are cutting schedules where you, it doesn't mean you let it go wild, but you cut less frequently, which, which allows the wildflowers to bloom. Now, um, Bit by bit, they've been working on identifying little areas where they're, they're sort of managing the cutting. But we really liked in a, um, a county-wide kind of change of policy. Now, what's happened in the last three months is because of the the COVID kind of uh, the COVID um, crisis, the council have been holding back on a lot of their cutting, mm -hmm. and of course, wildflowers are blooming all over the place. And there's been mm -hmm. little people have been saying, "Oh, it's so nice to see." I think one of the main reasons why, from my impression from speaking to the council, why they why they they've been very cautious to to let the, the flowers bloom is they're worried people think it looks untidy or bit, that people want a nice sort of perfect lawn rather than wildflowers. But I think mm -hmm. so many people have enjoyed seeing the wildflowers, and percep public perception is changing. I think there is a good case for saying, well, let's let's actually relax the cutting on some places. Now, we understand there are going to be some places, particularly by roads and roundabouts, where you can't do that because it's going to obstruct, it's going to be unsafe and it's going to obstruct of course. the car's vision and stuff, and that's fair enough. But they did, um, a couple of days ago, um, Rhonda Cunningham Taft Council, I need to post this online actually, have sent an update saying, addressing this and saying they are looking at extending those areas where they're going to relax the cutting. So I think we're having some effect. I think we're starting to kind of uh, make an impression. Amazing. It seems like keeping those wildflowers is both going to be nice for people because maybe people do want to see these wildflowers. Plus, they're so essential for the bee-friendly movement and for the bees themselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they look nice. Um, they're good for the bees and good for biodiversity. And also, I mean, it's less work 
ultimately it's less cutting because you know the council's having to pay people to cut it every three to four weeks you know um because i think that's what people want, you know mm. you'd imagine it's in everyone's best interest then <laughs> you think so yeah you think so but um mm. yeah yeah we'll see how it plays out amazing um so lastly do you have any advice for the people watching this documentary on how they can be be friendly um i would say that um if you have a garden um you can plant bee friendly flowers um sometimes you can plant wildflowers um but even just um just letting your letting your lawn um not cutting it as often and letting the you know dandelions and things that we think of as weeds buttercups or, or um, daisies you know these are all food for bees and other pollinators so even just delaying the cutting of your lawn can can be mm -hmm. something you can do or letting one little part go a little bit wild as well um having a pond having water in your garden helps um making a, a, a bug hotel or even just a pile of logs can provide habitat where they can live so if you've got a garden that's something great there's loads of stuff you can look, look online about helping bees in your garden um also look at your local area and your community you know if there's pieces of land where you could speak to your local council about you know do you have to cut this off often or if you're living in a more urban environment there's less wildflowers you could say well maybe you could plant wildflowers here or maybe plant bushes or trees or anything that that helps wildlife or um bees um so sort of look into that basically uh, speak to your councillor about it, find out who owns the land um, and, um, you know, set up a little group if you need to. Or look at, there's probably might be bee friendly groups already going there. If you've got mm -hmm. a Friends of the Earth group in your area, speak to them um, and see what they can do about it. Of course, because the, the bee friendly Ponty Preeth group is buzzing, literally. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. OK, brilliant. Thank you so much, Casper. Um, and... <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm sure everybody appreciates everything you've said. Yeah, hopefully. I think I've said everything I wanted to say. <laughs> Stay safe. Thanks thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers now. It was so interesting to see how a volunteer organisation, such as the Friends of the Earth, have been contributing towards the overall environmental push. Casper mentioned some very interesting activities, such as encouraging children and other community organisations to grow varieties of plants and vegetables. From this, it made me think about something such so essential as food. We have food for humans. We need to make sure we have food resources for the bees. This is one of the essential parts of being bee friendly within the community as mentioned, habitat, food and shelter. So I thought, how can I encourage people to create bee friendly food? I decided it would be a good idea to run some workshops. I wondered, how can I help raise awareness of the lack of bee-friendly planting in cities? Well, with the help of the University of South Wales Students' Union, I was able to run a selection of workshops across the different Students' Union sites, encouraging people to create bee-friendly planting. This was run through the creation of seed bombs. I set up a table in the USW Students' Union in the Cardiff campus. I had a bag of compost, some wildflower seeds and some biodegradable paper and string. For a small pay what you feel contribution, the public could create their own seed bombs to take with them or to be left with me and planted. Everyone that took part seemed to enjoy the activity and we made a lot of seed bombs. Not only this, everyone that came and took part or just walked by was given a handout talking about the uses and importance of seed bombs as well as their history and how to make them at home. I believe this was a success. I found these workshops very useful in getting people to talk about being bee friendly. However, I found that I wasn't reaching a wide enough area. Running some workshops within Pontypridd that already had this bee friendly status and running a workshop within Cardiff, a city only half an hour away, was not reaching the audience that I expected I would reach. I thought to myself, how can I get more people involved? What can I do? So I decided to go back to the widest community I know, the internet. I created a call out asking for people to send me their bee friendly ideas, photos and videos. I wanted to see what people were doing and why they were doing it. 
Thanks to the power of social media, I had a pretty large response. Here are some of the images and videos I received.
As you can see, I received quite a large amount of submissions, as this is only a portion of what I received. I found that as I received photos and videos from far and wide, I also received a wide range of questions. How do I take part in being bee friendly? What is happening that I can get involved in? Why should I be bee friendly? I realised I needed a way of taking what I'm good at, talking to people and delivering workshops, and send it just as far as I had sent the call out. I decided the best way I could do this was to create a seed bomb tutorial. I Here is the tutorial for you now. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Davies and today I'll be showing you how to make seed bombs. So if you don't know already, seed bombs are a form of sowing seeds in an alternative way, which is quite popular within the environmental activist populations. So um, I'm going to be showing you how to make them today and hopefully you can do some bee friendly work of your own at home. So you will need uh, non-peated compost, we have powdered clay and we have UK native wildflower seeds. So I am using my own compost from my own compost heap. I have dug a small hole in it to make sure that I don't have the super, super dry compost. Um, however, you can buy any unpeated compost from any garden centre. I'm also using uh, powdered clay that I found on Amazon. Um, many craft stores are not open at the moment. However, you can find powdered clay in most craft stores. Okay, so I will show you the measurement and the method of how to make your own seed bombs. So what you're going to need is a bowl and some measuring equipment. So I have these, a glass bowl and uh, one tablespoon measurement. So the reason I'm using one tablespoon is because this works best on a ratio. So you want five parts compost to three parts clay and one part seeds. So I'll start off with five tablespoons of soil. If you are using your own compost like myself, do have a look for worms first because they don't help seed bombs. And it's not really fair on the worms. Okay, three. Okay, so that's my compost. It's going to need a bit of a break apart. So it's nice and easy. Then comes the clay. So as I said, I got this off of Amazon. It's just simply um, powdered clay. I mean, I got it off Amazon because I can't go into a shop at the moment. But you can find it in most craft shops, except not hobby craft, I tried a while back. So, as I said, we want three of these. Brilliant, so that's the clay in the soil. We can throw those out of the way for now. And lastly, you want your seeds. So these are UK native wildflower seeds. Um, it's quite important that they're UK native because you will be well, planting them in the UK, I guess nation native, wherever you are. Um, because I am in the UK, I will need UK native seeds. Just chuck them in. This is about a tablespoon for I did measure them earlier. Wonderful. Um, so now you've got all your bits in there. You've got your compost, you've got your soil, and you've got your seeds. The last thing you need is a bit of water to bind them all together. Which, here's one I poured earlier. So, little dribbles at a time, and just start oh, That's very thick.
you really want to break the compost apart so it really has an opportunity to stick. Try and get off your fingers though, it's not too easy. Okay, it's going to look quite wet, but that's fine. Just roll them into balls. And another one I made earlier, and pop them on an old tray. You don't want a new tray because you will cover it in soil and it's not fab. Make them into little squishy balls. And there you have some seed bombs. So what you're going to want to do is leave those in a nice sunny part of your house, maybe leave them in your garden just to dry out. And once you've done that, you can throw them into wildlife, put them in your garden, maybe bury them. Um, this is a form of what they call guerrilla gardening. So it was an idea of uh, activism. People threw them into random bits of shrubbery, um, random parks, which I don't recommend because it is kind of vandalism. But if you see a hedge, slip one under a hedge and then you've got some bee friendly seeds. In case you couldn't see in the video, these are the seed bombs I created. Um, so I've got three of them at the moment. I've got a little bit left over to make some more. Thank you very much for watching. I'm going to go wash my hands uh, and stay safe and save the bees. So now, I have these seed bombs, and we've had a little bit of rain recently, so I've got an idea, but I'm going to need some help. So we are here in our local park, and Ellie has our seed bombs. Thankfully, at the moment, we've got this nice grass patch here, along with these trees. So we've got some nice long grass to throw our seed bombs into. Okay, let the seed spreading commence! Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed watching this as much as I've enjoyed making it. One thing that I hope that you can take away with you from this documentary is to do everything you can to save the bees. And secondly, to have fun with it. Thank you very much. I'm Elizabeth Davies.